The needs and viewpoints of rural residents have often clashed with urban population centers. That tension is part of the story of the West. But a few years ago, residents in eastern Oregon proposed a solution to their long-simmering frustration at being outvoted, moving their state borders so conservative Oregon residents could join Ruby Red Idaho. Even proponents know it's a long shot. But regardless of whether lawmakers and voters sign on, that philosophical division isn't going to go away anytime soon. Over the summer, Idaho Reports explored the origins of the anger that's driving the movement and whether supporters see any other path forward. Ask Greater Idaho supporters why they want to shift the state's borders to include Eastern Oregon, and you'll get a multitude of answers. They're a very red state, certain restrictions on gun ownership. We didn't agree with recreational marijuana. They have a totally different lifestyle. It'd be nice to just had our voice heard. But it boils down to one key thing. When you're ignored by your capital and by your legislators, it's extremely frustrating for people. Oregon is a single party state. The state level government is uh, completely all, you know, dominated by um, Democrats and, and left leaning people. And, and so it's left these folks out in eastern Oregon and in other parts of the rural Oregon as well, uh, feeling like they don't have a voice, they, they don't have a say, and they get policy forced on them that they don't want. Sound familiar? That's the same dilemma the minority faces everywhere. Just ask Democrats in Idaho. But there's more to it, says Ryan Booth, the postdoctoral fellow at Washington State University. Wanting to separate from a government that doesn't represent you is part of the American identity. We started by seceding from Great Britain, right? I mean, we said we're not, we don't want to be a part of that. So our American Revolution begins, you know, this story of us saying, no, we don't want that. We want something else. And so that, that sort of begat all of these other kinds of movements, including the U.S. Civil War, that ends up, you know, these breaking away and sort of forming new things, sort of baked into the DNA for Americans, uh, in a way. Mike McCarter of the Greater Idaho Movement agrees. He likens their movement to the American Revolution. What were the reasons? Why did the people want to become free and independent of England or British influence? And it's almost the same thing. It's unjust laws, no representation, and outrageous taxes. There are obvious differences between the American Revolution and the frustration of Eastern Oregon residents who are unhappy with the government in Salem. Still, that discontent is nothing new, says Keith Peterson, author of Inventing Idaho, The Gem State's Eccentric Shape. Conversations over Oregon's rural-urban divide date back to Oregon's 1857 Constitutional Convention, at which 60 delegates discussed what should be enshrined in the state's founding documents. That included the state's borders. Of these 60 people, only one represented the area east of the Cascade Mountains. There was a guy by the name of Charles Meigs, who came from Dalles City, which we now know as the Dalles, which was Wasco County. And Wasco County was gigantic. It included everything east of the Cascades, including all of southern Idaho and part of uh, western Wyoming. Peterson says Meigs recognized the cultural and socioeconomic differences between the eastern and western parts of the proposed state of Oregon. West of the Cascade Range, Oregon was already more urban, with access to the ocean. East of the range was high desert, destined to be rural, with a heavy agricultural focus. Not only are they different now, but they're always going to be different. That there's, there's, because of the geography of the west and the geography of the east, there's going to be cultural, economic, political differences between those folks and our folks. At the Constitutional Convention, Meigs argued for the new state's eastern boundary to be set at the Cascade Mountains. The arguments are, are much the same, at least in terms of the rural-urban divide. And Meigs basically outlines that, you know, no matter how much we grow, and we know eastern Oregon is going to grow, we will always be rural. Um, there's not the possibility for great urban centers in, in eastern Oregon. Uh, we will always be outvoted by the people in the West, but mainly our interests are just different. Meigs didn't get far with his arguments, ultimately getting only three votes. But he wasn't alone in his concerns about power being centered in Salem. In that same constitutional convention, there was a movement to establish a new territory or a new state 
the state of Jackson, which would include part of Southern Oregon, what became Southern Oregon, as well as Northern California. While the geographical areas were different, the issues were the same, a separation from the seat of government. That frustration rings true today in circles that have nothing to do with shifting borders. Western governors and legislatures have long expressed anger at Congress and the federal government for not understanding issues residents face in the West. I would really like to understand what the purpose of wilderness is. I don't uh, have any objection to uh, Governor Ray's definition. Wilderness is where people ain't. That's the bottom line. How do you include it as recreation then? If people can't really use it for recreation, how can you say wilderness is a recreation area? Well, don't mislead the media now, Governor, because it's open to all the public. If they can get out Only if they can foot. backpack. Or they can ride a horse, or they can float in a canoe or a raft. What's wrong with walking? Most of as, us can walk. As we know that from experience, that means about something less than 1% of the population. 1% of the population can walk? No, sir. Actually make use of wilderness areas for recreational purposes. I think that's their decision rather than their capability. Oh. Oh. North Idahoans are familiar with that exasperation, which they've felt since the territorial capital moved from Lewiston to Boise in 1864. So that idea that we are different, part of that during the territorial period was we're just damn upset at the people at Boise because you stole the capital. But there always was this, you know, you've left us up here. We're, we're isolated. We've got this little narrow panhandle. Um, we have nothing in common with the folks in southern Idaho, eastern Idaho, western Idaho. Over the years, there's been talk of splitting off northern Idaho and joining with eastern Washington to form a new state, but those ideas haven't gained much traction. Wash Idamont? Well, to most people, the current attempt to form a new state in the Northwest is simply a way of letting off steam about claims that state legislatures are not responding to the needs of the entire state. And while this is not the first attempt of its kind to form a new state in the Northwest, public officials backing the idea are quite serious about the possibility of seceding into what could become the 51st state of the Union. There have been these, this sort of sectionalism that has been part of America's story for quite some time, from the very beginning, I would say. And now you have rural-urban, which I think is sort of the latest iteration of these differences. Greater Idaho organizers recognize that their frustrations aren't unique to Eastern Oregon. Every state, every country has an aggrieved political minority. It's not just here. It's in every, every state in the Union. Because if you look at, at who controls the vote in Washington, Seattle Metro. Who controls the vote in Illinois, Chicago. Who controls the vote in New York, New York City, Atlanta controls Georgia. I mean, it's one right after another. But they think in this specific situation, their approach is one that makes sense, and they're getting more people interested in their proposal. I represent the center of Oregon rural community, and surrounding me, there's been 12 counties that have voted to take this conversation forward. I've clearly heard from my constituents, and I am here today because they've asked me to have this conversation. We've got so many like-minded people, people who share Idaho values, especially those old-fashioned traditional values. Why wouldn't we want to have that conversation? While interest might be growing in Idaho and Eastern Oregon, it isn't in the Oregon legislature. The next step for our movement is to get to the legislative level. Last year, we were able to get, uh, thanks to Representative Uhart, Representative Boyle, introducing the memorial in the Idaho House. With the Idaho House passed a, me a, a memorial saying, we are ready to have this conversation with the state of Oregon. Um, we attempted to do the same thing in the state of Oregon, and it did not go anywhere in the legislature last year. But that's where we're at now. And moving the border doesn't just require sign-off from Oregon and Idaho. Congress needs to approve the shift, too, if it even gets to that point. And it's going to be tough to get them on board for such a novel solution to a universal problem. It's no fun being in the minority. Once these states are established, it's, it's virtually impossible to, to change borders, unless the few times it's happened again, it's been cases with meandering rivers or things like that, and, and we've been involving very small bits of real estate, nothing like 
you know, the, the size of, of greater Idaho, which is basically all of eastern Oregon joining Idaho. We reached out to Oregon Democratic lawmakers to ask their thoughts, not on greater Idaho so much as the growing discontent among Oregon's rural residents and whether they care. We didn't hear back. But it's a question we could ask the majority in any state. No policy is universally popular, so what does a majority party owe to those in the minority? Every governor's race, every cycle, election cycle in Oregon, we, we hear a lot of talk about, we're going to be a governor of the whole state, we're going to, you know, listen to Eastern Oregon. We're going to address Eastern Oregon specific, you know, issues that, that deal with them. It hasn't happened. And, and the people in Eastern Oregon feel like that hasn't, that outreach, those specific policy, you know, um, ideas that, that would, would help Eastern Oregonians, those haven't happened. The, the political tension has only gotten greater. The political frustration's only gotten greater. In my travels, I go over west side and I talk to a state representative over there and I said, you know, the problem is that they don't listen to our representatives in the legislature. He says, stop, stop right there. And I go, what? He says, Mike, we hear what they're saying. We just outvote you. And that's life in the minority, folks. <laughs> that's... Idaho House Minority Leader Ilana Rubel knows what it's like to be outvoted. It's, it's very discouraging. I mean, it's certainly not fun to be steamrolled on, on many issues of what we, which we care about deeply. But Rubel points out that Oregon Republicans are actually far better situated to influence policy in their legislature. Forty percent of Oregon's lawmakers are minority Republicans. Compare that to Idaho, where the minority Democrats make up just 17 percent of the legislature. In fact, Oregon's Republicans are powerful enough to shut down legislative proceedings in protest, which they've done multiple times by walking out, denying their colleagues a quorum. Colleagues, a quorum is not present. The latest protest during their 2023 session lasted six weeks and resulted in the majority Democrats agreeing to change provisions in an abortion bill. We don't have the numbers to be able to deny them quorum in Idaho. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, we, we, I think it's because they're actually not that small a minority that they actually have considerable power to do that kind of thing. I think supermajority rule is unhealthy. They don't have supermajority rule in Oregon, though. Uh, and so the minority actually has substantial power. Rubel isn't unsympathetic to frustrations of those in the minority, even if they're in a different party. But she has some advice on how to get things done. I think as a member of the minority party, you do have to work a lot harder. You have to gather five times as many facts in support of your case. You have to mobilize groups on the outside. You have to think creatively about who are the constituencies that would benefit from this piece of legislation or be harmed by that piece of legislation. Reach out to them, educate them, let them know here's, you know, here's who you can email to, here's you can, how you show up at a hearing and testify. We have to work very hard. We have to collaborate. Uh, we, we have to bring in members of the majority party on everything that we do. It's just something we have learned to adapt to. Idaho Representative Judy Boyle was an early supporter of the Greater Idaho Movement. She says even if the movement isn't successful in moving the borders, it might still have other advantages. It might make legislators listen to what their constituents actually want and make governors listen. We're about getting representation and, and policy for, for Eastern Oregon that people in Eastern Oregon want and make sense for their communities. There's other ways to get there. Unfortunately, those other ways have not happened. What we're trying to do is we're trying to solve a problem, and it's a problem that's been around for a very long time, and it's only gotten worse over time. So we're offering people a solution. We think that moving the state border would solve the urban-rural divide in Oregon and solve the issue of mismatched government to people's values, because that's what we have right now. I'm, I'm an older guy. I've invested a lot of money and time in my property, making it, preparing it for my latter years. I, I don't want to abandon that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just like to see our community have some say. Anytime people will talk is good. It's a success.